All right. Mike Rogers. Mark Schuline. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're going to do that again. Thank you for having me. Dude, I'm stoked. Thank you for being part of the Passion Project because truly, and we talked a little bit about it, like this is just our ability to have a little talk story session. That's it. Right. It's kind of like what we all do if we're sitting out in the surf or mm -hmm. on a long paddle. Yeah. You just talk story. Yeah. And some people would say I talk too much and they have to listen too much, but it's all good. But no, I'm super grateful to have you here. Thank you. I, I like your stories. <laughs> <laughs> some people would say I have like four and I just repeat them all the time. I on don't our think long so. No. Well, listen, if, if you're watching, you'll recognize this guy. If you're a surfer or a paddler from Southern California, cause he's kind of a staple mainstay, but Mike, humor me. I'm just going to do a little quick overview. Okay. Um, so if you surf in Newport Beach and have for the last 40 years, give or take, we can clarify that, you'll know this guy. 50? 50. All right. Um, if you're at Blackie's on any given day that there's waves, yeah, Mike's there. Usually. If you follow Newport Beach on Instagram and you see all these beautiful sunrise photos, that's Mike. If you see a guy posting fun little videos about um, Australian shepherds, that's Mike too. <laughs> and if you see a guy <clears throat> a couple years older than the guys he's paddling with out on a prone board on the weekend, that also is Mike Rogers. So that's true. Yeah. Mike, we go way back. We do. So I think we met in the mid nineties. We did. Right. Yeah. And since then we've known each other pretty well through the paddle world and the fundraising world and the surf. And we're going to get to all that. But what I realized is I've known you a long time and I don't know half your story. Like I truly have no idea where you grew up. I don't know what got you into surf or paddling. I don't know. I really don't know anything. And that's what this, this is just a storytelling pod where we get to get to kind of connect all the dots. Okay. So we're going to get into all the cool stuff that, that I know, cause I can ask some pretty fun questions cause of all the ocean related exploits that you have. Where did you grow up? And like, because we're going to get to how you got here, but Mike, let's just start. Where did you grow up? Anson, oh. uh, Newport Harbor, played football, played uh, track. My dad's house is right between Anson and Harbor. Okay, so we're talking, we're sitting here in the Newport Beach, Costa Mesa border on 17th right. Street. You're talking about two schools that are about a mile from here. Correct. So you grew up a mile from here. I did. You haven't gone very far. No, I haven't. Okay. Which is rad. I haven't gone very far. My wife and I both grew up on the other side of the bay and went to Coronel Del Mar High School. So we're, you're a sailor. Right. My two older kids are both sailors. So we're house divided and we're, yeah. we're sea kings. So, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. So you played football. Um, well, let, let's step back. Your parents, you, were you born at Hogue? No, I was, I was born in L.A. Hogue wasn't here. God, it wasn't here yet. No, there was no 552 club. Yeah. In those days. Do you mind saying what year you were born? 50. In 50. How old does that make you? 20 years older than 20 you. 20 years. Yeah. Well, I was born. Yeah, you're 19 years older than me. So. Well, I'm edging into 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to get over the hump. So if you're listening and not watching, you'll see that this is a very good looking dude right here for his age and pretty fit and quite accomplished in the water. So accolades and, and props to you. Thank you. Um, okay. And so you, so, well, I of appreciate course. it, but backing up your parents, how did you guys get to Newport from LA? When did that happen or how did that happen? Uh, I was a little kid. <clears throat> I went to military school uh, for a couple years in, and then, in the LA area. Yeah, and then my mother and father split, mm -hmm. and my stepmom was uh, at, uh, next to the high school with my dad, super nice lady. And I said to my mom, "I'm leaving because I didn't like my stepfather." So I moved to Newport at a young age, and and here you here are. Here I am. Got it. So you went to Ensign. You mm -hmm. went to Newport Harbor. Well, you said, I was going to ask you about sports. So you grew up playing football. Any other sports? Football, track, and tennis. Got my it. senior year at and Newport. You, yeah. And you played football all the way through? I did. And I went to OCC, and I was a middle guard. At Orange Coast College. I was, yeah. Got it. And that, so Orange Coast College is a two-year junior college. Mm -hmm. Did you go anywhere after that? I graduated from Fullerton. Got with it. an art degree. Oh, I have an art degree. Do you? Yeah, I do. All right. I don't use it very much. Do you use yours? <laughs> um, I think I do. From the photography angle. Right? Yeah, I guess I do. So right. let's, again, there's no rules to this conversation. Why art? Um, 
Why art? Um, because that side of my brain works a whole lot better than the, than the basic black and white side of my brain. Got so, it. Sorry, I got to hit, quit hitting the table. <laughs> um, what year did you, it was your first classic? Well, no, no, no. You don't get Oh, I'm things. jumping ahead. You don't get okay. to ask the questions God and be I'm way sorry. jumping ahead. Okay. You're way, but we, yeah. trust me, we will get to the okay. classic. Yeah. Um, so you have an art degree. Did you focus on any specific genre of art? Ceramics. Oh. And then I opened a business. I had one for 12 years. Okay, stop there. What yeah. business was that? Ceramics. Doing what? Making bowls, like plates, was this lamps. the art side of it, or was this more on the mass production? No, mass side? production. Yeah, really. And, and where was your studio? Or your it was in Costa Mesa at my house. Oh, I had it. a garage and two rooms and a, a large. Uh, and kill. you're you're throwing on the wheel all day long. All day long. Well, after surfing. Yes. Well, yes. we'll get to that too. Yeah. So, when did you start doing the ceramics? Well, in college. It just, there was a lot of cute girls, and, uh -huh. and uh, okay. so I... Now, now we're seeing, <laughs> yes, now I get the motivation. Yeah, well, there's al there always is motivation. Got it. For and so you do ceramics, you have a business for, t what was the name of your business? Clayworks. Got it. And you were doing, this was um, mass production, where were you selling stuff? Everywhere. Um, like in retail stores, or at like... Retail, at yeah, and most of them are out of business and gone now, it was so long ago. But, Interesting. Uh, do you still throw? No, but my brother's building a studio in his backyard in Corona Del Mar, and I have to teach him how to throw. Oh, fun. So um, we're all going to be throwing. You can come over and throw, too. I would love to learn. My best yeah. friend, Jeff Netzer, is a, he teaches ceramics all over all different, at OCC. At Fl That's and, awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah, I've never, you know, I've got an art degree, but I've never thrown well, on a wheel in we'll my life. teach you. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. That sounds kind throwing's of Throwing's like surfing in your hands. Yeah, yeah. You know, surfing's all this and throwing's right here, but mm. there's similarities. So why did you stop? Um, Vietnam started producing pottery that was a tenth the cost that I had to produce it here. Their labor costs and their, their glazes, clays, everything was nothing. And they, you know, here comes these giant pots that are you know, a tenth of what I'm trying to charge. Mm. And I wasn't, and I had a good price, but this is what it costs to make it in California. Yeah. So. Inter and that hasn't changed in the business world. That hasn't changed today. That's I'm Walmart. Sure. That's, yeah. I mean, that's mass production of just about everything right. is overseas. And that's why for exactly that reason. Interesting. So <clears throat> we're going to stay on the career front and we will, trust me, we'll get back to all the other stuff and where it fits in with your career and okay. age and everything. Yeah. But, um, so you close Clayworks. Closed it. Yeah. What year would what year did you have your business? I can't even remember. I mean you're talking seventies, eighties? I, I don't remember these things. Gotcha. Like you do. What did you have for breakfast? Remember that part? I didn't have anything for breakfast. <laughs> I had two eggs a little while ago. Got it. All right. I'm just I'm just yeah. checking. Okay. Um what did you do after after you closed it? Um it was really hard to find a job and there was um the uh Newporter Hotel had a it didn't even say what it was it just said come down here get dressed up and 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 so I went down there and uh, it was a driving 6 a.m. shift when I'm you like, say driving driving you know you're people, driving somebody around I'm driving a van I'm driving a van at 6 in the morning 6 to 3 30 every day and luckily I switched that to 3 30 uh, to 11 that's a much I, more surf well, uh, appropriate schedule thank you yeah. got it yeah and, and so then, what, what was your role there? What, what was the title well, of that? I worked all the way through that to the point where I was the head of guest services, which was cool. And the Newporters, right? I mean, you really haven't gone far. There's I mean, a lot of history. I know. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it, it's, it's no, 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 no. Why, uh, why would you ever leave here? I don't know. It kind of works. It kind of works well. Okay. Yeah. So head of guest services at a pretty long-term hotel. At the hotel. time, yeah. It was one of the best. We, how long were you there? 32 years. Wow. Yeah. So you've kind of always, that's, I mean, that's a customer service, heavy customer service focus, right? I love customer service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I do. Got it. And what did that, so 32 years there, mm -hmm. that's a long time for anybody to be in a profession and to stay there. Did you really enjoy that? I did. It was great. What, yeah. what, what about that type of, what was it? Just dealing with the public and taking care of people, make sure they had a good stay? All of that, and then if there was ever a problem, they sent me in. They called me the fireman. Mm. I went in and put out the fire. Got it. So, Was there an element of that of really kind of shining a light on 
your home city of Newport Beach. Like people are coming from all over yes. the world. That's who you're dealing with. And you get to tell them where to go and what, like, yeah. is it a pride thing to some degree in that? Well, I could tell them where to go and what to see. Uh, and you got to learn these people's families. They came from Texas or they came, wherever they came from, they came straight to you. Hey, Mike, what's going on in Newport? And I like that. So That's cool. Would you see the same people time and again, year after year? Year after year. And they'd come look for you? Look at their little kids grow up, get married. The so you're like thing. the mayor of the hotel. Yeah. Maybe the mayor of Newport. Well, you're, you're the mayor of Blackie's, which is our local surf spot where you are the... You know, you're on, there might be a statue next to the Ben, the ben Carlson no. statue somewhere no. down the road. No? No. Maybe my ashes someday. <laughs> well, that's a long way off. Yeah. A well, long way well, off. Well, we'll see. Okay, yeah. so you're there 32 years. Why do, you, do, why do you leave that job? Change, and then I became a landscape designer. Well, tell us about that. Worked for Instant Jungle. That's right. So and Instant Jungle was a beautiful place. That was over on like off Victoria. It was on area? Canyon mm -hmm. at one time. And then there was other growing grounds all Got over. It. So you were getting your Hawaii on it because they were big in palms and tropicals. All, all tropicals. A yeah. lot of plumeria, which is something that I think if I've seen from some of your posts. Yes, I um, had a lot. And thus the Hawaiian shirt. Yes. You know, I was wondering before you came in, just a side note, if you were going to have pants, pants on, on. I don't think I've ever seen your, your legs covered up ever in my life. Not surfing and not ever. It would probably be a wise suggestion if I wore pants. He comes in. Exactly. Interesting. See, that's where mind manifests. It's like through, you know, running hardware stores. You're like, where do you use art? Well, store design and layouts and yeah. graphics and all that stuff. Oh, that's cool. And you did that for how long? Like eight years. Got it. What about after that? After that, I went to work for uh, Endless Sun Surf School next to the pier. Yep. Uh, which used to be Scott Moreland, and then it was Tim and Amy. I worked for them. But there was, t you know, I was getting older. I couldn't do eight people at once, and I couldn't teach for six hours in the water. And I'd already been stung 42 times by stingrays. Yeah, I knew that. One. Yeah. Hold on. Let, let's just stop there. What? Is that really the number? 42. Because I know you keep count. I, of course I do. You've been stung by stingrays 42 times. I have. Those, I got stung once, and I, it has left a mark where I'm like, I'm always nervous that I'm going to get hit. Yeah. 42. God, 42. that sucks. I, I might was, explain what your memory problems. <laughs> Probably. You know the loop There's a race. lot of poison in that. The loop race, how you paddle yeah, out San to Diego. sea and then you start, right? Mm -hmm. um, Dan Mann's race. Yes. My first step up to get on the board got hit. Did the whole race oh my and my foot kept getting worse and worse and worse. So just for context. Yeah. And we're going to get into the paddling and we're going to finish up with your, your career stuff. Um, to get <clears> hit by. So we're totally jumping ahead, but we're on it. Stingray? What's it feel like when you get hit by a stingray? Anywhere from a one to a ten. Yeah, but what does it feel like? As it, it makes a bee sting like is like something kissed you. Um, it's amazing. You know, I had blood coming out of this vein, and the guards go, "I have never seen anything like that." Every time my heart pumped, the Oof. blood would shoot about fourteen inches out of my foot, and <sighs> it's still numb. I still? hate those guys. Yeah, it's still numb. Um, and then to go, so my one experience, I got hit in the foot going out at the beginning of a surf in Huntington. And I'm like, screw it, I'm just gonna go surf. And what I didn't realize is it gets worse, worse. and worse and you can start to feel your Right? Correct. Oh, I, I, I swear, it has left a mark. I surfed my whole life like carefree. I don't worry about sharks. I don't, that one experience, that little sucker got me, totally changed. Like I'm so much more concerned now when I go in the water every well, time. If I was teaching for four hours in the water, I'm walking around with these young students, right? Grabbing their board, getting them, facilitating them, getting yeah. into waves. So I'm walking around, my numbers are going up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't just get on my board, I was walking around. I'd have some like big beefy, I'd be wearing like Doc Martin ankle boots yeah. in the water as a co as a coach or a sounds instructor good. sounds uncomfortable oh, that sounds terrible yeah um okay so how long did you teach 
You still you still teach and I coach, teach, don't you? To some I teach privately. Privates. Yeah, I I just can't get run over anymore. I gotta take good care of the the people that I teach. Got it. Any idea how many people you've taught? Thousands. I don't I don't know. Their kids come. Their kids' kids come. Yeah. In fact, you taught know. my nephew Jackson at one point. I did. Right. Yeah. That's he so got cool. better too. Yeah. Interesting. You know what? I, and I don't know who, but when I turned eleven and I really wanted to learn to surf, my parents are from New York. And Ohio so surfing wasn't and during the 60s I was born in 69 so during that time like surfing did not have a glowing reputation right so they're like listen if you're gonna surf you're taking a lesson so I had to go take a lesson they got me in a lesson right at the north side of Newport Pier right where you've taught right in Blackies and I saw stingrays or sand sharks the first time and I was super freaked out and it, I kind of took a a year off and then I got hyper into it and it never really stopped but yeah. I learned right where you teach that's pretty cool. It was a long time Did ago. Did the school too. teach you? Endless Sun? I don't know who it was. I mean, this would have Scott been in... Scott Moreland, this, maybe? I don't remember names. This would have been in 1980. It's been I, a minute. Moreland had that school Got back it. Then. That's who yeah. it would have been. Yeah. Pretty neat. Okay, so you, you're still doing that today. You're still... Yeah. From yeah. time to time. I enjoy it. all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and it's probably very similar to when you were in charge of guest services at the hotel. You're... People come back to you, the parents are probably super stoked. I mean, if you're teaching people in the water and oftentimes the parents don't have any experience, like it's a scary, th if you have little kids in the water, you want somebody you have a high level of confidence in, right? right. I'm guessing that's what you provide them. Well, cause it's not a soccer field. We've got rip currents, we've got waves, we've got other surfers. Stingrays. Stinger I forgot about <laughs> stingrays. <laughs> I haven't been hit in a year or so. so. Okay. We're gonna knock on wood. This yeah. is the one time. Okay. okay. Perfect, perfect. Um, did you ever have career visions of something different? Or did you think you were gonna be doing pottery forever? Or did- I did. That's what you thought you were gonna be doing? I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Um, are you excited that you're gonna have a chance to throw at your brothers? Is that yeah, good? I'm really excited. Yeah, it's gonna be great. I mean, I think that from my experience, I know I'm totally off topic, but like if you're an artist or if you have that passion for doing art, and you don't do it, it's kind of like having a passion for surfing and not surfing because it's an expression. Like for me, I could, if, if when I was doing art much more at school, like I would get lost in it. Like that's, hours would pass while you're in it. Like that's, that's a, that's that flow state almost like paddling or athletics it. or anything yeah, else. And exactly. you don't, it's hard to get. A lot of time you have to get it when you're paddling for a bunch of hours, right? Yeah, right. That's cool that you can find it. Oh, I hope you find it again in, uh, in throwing. That's super I cool. I will. We're going to be ready to start building here in about a month. That's neat. So again, you didn't have, growing up, did you have a goal for like a career? Did you want to be, did you know, what you, like, did you have a goal or were you like kind of just flowing with it? I was a, a tennis instructor for a long time oh. and I teach over there at the high school. But when I was playing football and everybody else was drinking, I used to run down the hill, swim the bay, cross the bay, run to the wedge, come back, swim the bay, go back up the hill, and then run stadiums. So when Hell Week came and everybody was throwing up, I was like, what's the big deal? Right? Got it. So I think that's where that long distance started to yeah. creep in. It's so interesting. Okay, and we're going to get into that right now. We're going to go <clears> into <throat> the surf piece. But we'll come back to that because for me, like, when you talk that, you're talking my language, right? I know. Like, I know. <laughs> but not everybody gets it. But I'm fortunate enough, you are too, to hang out with people that look at that and go, yeah, let's go do that this weekend. And yeah. I know a lot of people go, you're going to do what? Why? Yeah. I'd rather go have three beers. You know what I mean? No. No, I love that. I didn't yeah. see, you start to see the common threads of people because things don't change that much. Like somebody might go, hey, I was, I had some, you know, addictive problems or I had, I was overweight and I wanted to change my way. And now I'm really into it. I know right. a lot of people that have had different motivations for getting into endurance sports and everything. Yeah. But there's also a lot of us that have been pretty, I look back over my life. I'm like, I can see it when I was 12 years old, when I'd get on my bike at four in the morning or four 30 in the morning and go ride all over. And you could back then right. ride all over the place. I, I just haven't stopped. Before Nike and before jogging, I used to run the streets of Newport and people would go, what are you stealing? You know, mm. what are you doing? Why are you running? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Isn't it normal to run? So that was, I was running before. Got it. Okay. Well, this craze. is a perfect setup. So yeah. we talked career and what brought you here. So where does the water come in to play with you? I started surfing when I was nine. My dad would have a hangover and he'd mm. go get a Bloody Mary and drop me off at the beach. Where would he get the Bloody Mary? 
uh, it was called the stuffed t-shirt stuffed t-shirt on 15th street you remember that sure yeah. it's coming back I great believe. breakfast is it yeah, yeah they're that redoing was, it it was unreal yeah so he would drop you off where at blackies at blackies are the point which are your i was going to say those are the if you see mike if it's winter time you're going to see him at blackies now this for those that don't know that is newport pier and it's the surf spot is named after the bar that is still there and it's probably been there for i don't know 50 60 whatever years yeah um and then the point is 18th Street, which is five streets south on the other side of the pier, and that's the summer spot. And that's the south swell. And that's the south swell. And you will see Mike getting lots of waves in both places all year round. Less waves now, I'm working on it. Yeah, well, you, just like I asked you how many people you've trained, if I asked you how many waves you've caught out, <laughs> you know, I don't, it's I don't, a lot, of, it's a I don't lot. Know. It's I don't an incredible, know. I mean, it would be an incredible number if there was a way to get that number, how many waves you've got at Blackies in your life. Don't know. 10,000? Well, 10, I, I got more 20, at 56th Street than I so, got at Blackies. Okay. All right. We will get to the different spots and why. So you, yeah. your dad drops you off. And this is in, so this would have been in 60, 1960-ish. In so 59, 60, 59, 60. Exactly. So this is, yeah. this is pre-shortboards. This is all longboards. Yeah. What was, the, and what was the culture like? What was it like surfing in Newport? in 1960 59 60. it was great it was uncrowded the guys that were out there knew what they were doing and uh i'd paddle the bay and i'd yell at on lido and wake up my friends and we'd paddle across and we'd go out and we'd surf if unless it was the weekend and my dad had a hangover and then he would drive you down there. that was a different thing yeah got it got it um newport was i don't know i i keep complaining because of covid there's a huge influx of surfers. I can't even call them surfers, but people that want to surf that don't know anything about the history of surfing, and I don't even think they care to learn, we're here. That's their whole deal. And you're like, dude, I'm, I'm on this wave, and there's 10 of you inside talking. No etiquette. No. Yeah, what's crazy, right, is how that's changed over the years in yeah. anywhere, some places more than others. If you're in a, a heavy wave spot somewhere in Hawaii, I mean, the etiquette was severe. If you broke that kind of etiquette chain of command, I mean, you'd get pecking slapped. order. Pecking yeah. order. Yeah. Blackies in when waves there's when there's not waves of consequence, then it requires people to have respect and understand it. And if yeah. they don't, it, anybody can catch waves out there. It's not That's difficult. True. No. And you can then then you're in people's way. You can ride any kind of craft, and you know, the the most popular surfboard in the world or the most sold produced board in the world is what. Uh, Jerry Lopez's uh, wave storm wave storm from Costco. Yeah. Anybody you can, can get, get in the water pack, right? I don't even know, but you they can come, get in. They get 10 of those on top of the car when they come down in the morning. It's yep. kind of a scary situation. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely changing. COVID really did just like anything. Yeah. Skiing, mountain biking, et cetera. Like if you could do something outside, that was the time to do it. And it's really f more, even more hyper-focused at spots like Blackie's where there's parking, there's showers, you're not going to get beat up. It's super accessible for waves. The only real downside is you might get hit by a stingray. Oh, yeah. I forgot about them. But you're not going to get hit by an adult out there because everybody's videoing and all the parents are on the beat. You can't. There's no regulating. When I, when I was a kid, if you got in the way of an elder, they hit you on the back of the head. He didn't worry about it. And you went in going, okay, I, I get the message. And you went back to the other side of the pier until you got good enough to, yeah. to understand. Not anymore, huh? No, uh -uh, you can't hit anybody. <laughs> you can't even tap them. You know, it's, I heard recently that in Hawaii, it's gotten so bad that it's mostly the young, like the young kids with their parents on the beach that have, you know, that live close by, but like they're super entitled. I, I could be wrong. This is just what I've heard recently, but it's the, the parents are on the beach. They're not going to be fun. These parents are pushing them hard into it. And as a result, like ex that, that pecking order is blown up. There isn't yeah. really interesting. Some of us have surfed a lot less as a result of this, and taken up other sports as. Well, you can go to your own place on your yeah. boards and your uh, your different vehicles that you paddle. Yeah, well, that's some of the beauty of it. I haven't tried yet. Well, we'll talk about the paddling because you're still getting. I mean, we're just on different craft doing the same thing, really, right? So, yeah. so surfing. Surfing. You start when you're nine or ten. Do you keep playing the other sports at that time? Well, obviously you I went did. on to play football. So oh yeah. I thought I was going to be a professional football player. 
Mm. At Ensign, I was five foot seven. At Harbor, I was five eight, and that was it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Got uh, it. Yeah. But um, you enjoyed playing football. Loved it. Loved with a passion. And you played both years at OCC, Orange Coast Community College. Yeah. Did you play at Fullerton? I did not. Did not. Did they even have a team? Baseball. They were well known for baseball. But not. Football. Not football. Got it. At the time. So when you when did surfing become more of the focus or the only focus? Surfing was always the focus, even with all the other sports. Mm. Um, when I got older, like I said, friends would want to go drink, and I would want to get up early and go check the surf. So it was a driving force to keep keep clean, keep healthy. Got it. So you've seen. I mean, I love this stuff because. The history of Newport is something that just captivates me because we moved here when I was a year old and we've watched it change quite a bit. You've oh. watched it change a whole lot more. I mean, you read the history of Newport and it was a pretty sleepy town because it was hard to get to from LA until the 50s, I think. And that's when a lot of these places that are now some of the most expensive real estate in the world were like Lido Island you referenced, like they couldn't give it away. Mm -mm. Babel Island couldn't give it away. No. For decades and decades and developers continue to fail and now, <laughs> it's 18 zeros on some of those houses, right? My dad used to go to the Pescador and you'd have... What was the Pescador? It was a restaurant just down the hill. Um, down on Coast Highway? Uh-huh. Okay. And they had, what are those fish called that eat skin and your fingers and everything? Piranha? Piranhas. My dad always used to grab my hand and start Hold on, hold on, hold on. What? Pescador restaurant. Yeah. What's there now where it was? God, I don't know. It's been too but long. somewhere down by the, where the yeah. chart house was down right in that area? Yeah. Like Mariner's Miles, what right. they call it. Okay, so it's and on the bay, on Coast Highway. Errol Flynn would be there. John Wayne would be there. John was always on his boat. He What's was, the name of the boat? Wild Goose. What's the name of the bar right next wild to us? Wild Goose. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and his, his boat is, is a, the Wild Goose is still in the bay, and it's used as a party rental boat. And he probably rolled over in his grave when he yeah. saw that, because that was a converted minesweeper? Yes. Yes. In World War II. Right. Um, so Pescador had a, an aquarium with piranha in it. And my dad would like to grab my hand and try to put it, I'm going to put it in the tank. You know, you're a little kid. That's yeah. scary But I've stuff. never heard of a piranha in a tank, especially in Newport. See, this is the stuff I love. You oh, just never hear this stuff. Yeah, there was a lot of piranhas here. And they put them in freshwater areas and they, they took over the population. They ate everything. Here? Yeah. I've never heard this story before. <laughs> really? <laughs> you never heard about the problems with people getting rid of their pet piranhas? Uh, are you pulling my leg? I am not pulling your leg. This is true. Okay. I love this. I don't know if I believe it. I guess I have to. You were there. All right. Yeah. That is great Newport history that um, somebody needs to tell a story about it. We can get Newport Beach in the rear view. Uh, well, those guys, yes. They'll tell a great story. Okay. That one, that one we need to do. All right. So you would surf. You were still playing other sports. Um, what was a regular week like? I mean, at that time, how often would you surf? Uh, I'd start the day, except during football season because we had the morning workout. So you would surf every day, or every sure. day that you could. Yes, absolutely. God, and that hasn't changed. And you, you, was it always primarily blackies or the point? You, you, you mentioned 50, fifty-six. Fifty-six. When did, when did so? In local surf parlance, you can start at the lower streets, blackies, and work your way up. Blackies at like twenty-third street. Yeah. 56 is obviously all the way up. And you kind of, as a kid, you would work your way up. It's a little bit more advanced, a little bit more advanced, a little bit more competitive. 56 was the peak of the, for, for decades, Echo Beach with Quicksilver. I mean, that was the mecca for local surf. True. How, you spent a lot of time there. But 56 is another south swell. So you have the point or you have 56. Yeah. And they're both competitive when you get a good south swell. Got it. And again, it was pretty mellow back then crowd wise oh Girl. yeah we had good pecking order and we had that jetty locked down but how crowded was it during i mean well, like 12 guys you know but i would imagine that whole stretch if there's decent waves right now there's you could walk across heads from guys. one to the other Correct. all the way yeah back then i would imagine it was much much less 12 guys gosh that's amazing yeah It'd be a good time to be a surfer right yeah i think so gotcha um and what's been the allure of surfing to you? Like, why has that been such a passion? 
I think that I just like to be in motion, and I love water. If I see water and kelp and a Garibaldi, I could sit there and stare at that for three hours, which we do sometimes when we're paddling. No, for sure. Hey, yeah. look at that Garibaldi. We did it today, um, and we saw a whale and some dolphins. All that stuff counts, you know? I mean, it's, it's amazing. Okay, so you're moving into, we'll probably go back and forth into surf because it's gonna tie in, but you, you walked right into paddling. What did you do today? I paddled uh, eight and a half miles, paddled from Coast Guard down towards El Moro and back. Just, we, I haven't paddled in a week, so I needed it. Yeah, in a week. And, and you went how many miles? That's eight, a little over eight, eight, eight and a half. half. Well, not at your speed. Well, don't worry about my speed, but you're on, what are you paddling? 14. 14 foot prone paddleboard, which again, for those that aren't familiar, you lay on your belly or you're on your knees, but you're just paddling with your arms, just like a surfboard. Correct. So there's a 12 foot, which is called stock. That's stock what you've board. historically I, paddled a lot of. I did. I raised 14 them. foot and then unlimited, which is what I've typically paddled, which is yeah. 16, 17, 18 foot, a little which, bit easier. And you're, and you're a good knee paddler, which I never was. It goes a long way. And now I can barely get up. <laughs> um, so prone paddling, how'd you get into that? There was only three paddlers in Orange County in those days. Okay, when did you, let's back, prone paddling started, surfing kind of started as prone paddling back in the yes. 30s, 40s, 50s. The Catalina race, which we'll talk about, started in the 50s. And you would have started, so when did you start? 95, I raced in 95. In 95. That was the I first started time. in 94. Okay. I was paddling a windsurfer that I had to sand the plastic rail so it didn't tear up my arms. And I'd paddled it every day, back and forth. And I counted to 10, and then to 20, and then to 40, 10 to 60. And it was, we didn't have watches. So why? Why not just go paddle a surfboard or just go surf? Because my whole life I've looked at Catalina Island. And there is talk, it's history. The guys have crossed the channel. And in my mind, it's like, there's no way in hell I can do that. And then uh, my wife's father got cancer and died. And I said, I need to find a vehicle to raise money. It, it, you get tired of saying, well, I give it the office or I'll try to help. I said, I'm gonna start something. And I started Paddle for the Cure for Hogue Hospital Cancer, which I believe was the first aquatic fundraiser, followed closely by yours, Ocean of Hope, which went along and raised a lot of money. Did a lot of good. Yeah, it really followed your model. We'll talk about that in a second. So, yeah. so that was the genesis for you to get into prone. You, your father-in-law had cancer and died. And you said, I want to go paddle that channel to raise money in his honor. Is, is that what I understand? Well, the idea was, how am I going to raise money and try to make a difference? Mm -hmm. I can't say I'm going to go walk around the high school 10 times, the high school track. I got to think of something big and painful. And that's it, the Catalina Channel's painful. And then I would go up to the cancer ward and you know, talk to people and they're going, you're doing really good stuff. I go, no, you guys are doing good stuff. Just keep, keep strong. You know, I'm gonna go raise money. And I did. So, so you had a goal, you wanted to help and you said, paddling <clears throat> that channel is how I'm gonna do it. Mm -hmm. Now I gotta figure out how to, what kind of craft to do it on, is that? Or I want to do it on a paddleboard, but I'm going to do it on a, like where did the windsurfer come in, and where did where did a actual prone board come in? Well, once I got pretty good at paddling the windsurfer, and I saw what a piece of crud it was, yeah, I went and uh, what did I get? A Jack Linky first. Mm -hmm. Remember him in Laguna? From Laguna, sure. Yeah, and uh, I got a little better. So I don't know. I just had to help. It was you know, it was time. So and this was 1994. Correct. And I raced in 95, and you raced in? 96 was my first one. What's well, really interesting. Good time that you came in during the race. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. We'll get to that, because there's, a, there's yeah. a whole other story there. Yes. I didn't realize. I thought, I just assumed that you had started a lot earlier. So you started, mm -mm. how old were you when you started then? In 95. 94. What was it, 45? Oh, 44 when I 44. started. 44. Raced when I was 45. And I would have been 24 about that. Yeah, so um, I did my first classic when I was... 26 in 1996, but I had started paddling. It's really interesting. So let me step back. I grew up surfing here. And when I did the youth employment program through the lifeguard department, um, I got on a paddleboard as part of the training and I was 
out in the front. I was average at everything else. I was mid-pack swim, mid-pack run. And I always remembered that. And many, many years later, it's a college, and a guy comes down, transfer down to USD, my buddy Brian Lanigan. And he'd done the Catalina Classic multiple times. At that time, he was a lifeguard up in Palos Verdes. He had a Joe Barkboard. But he had this thing on his car, and on his truck. And I'm like, what is that? Ends up that it was an unlimited prone board. And this is 1990, probably 1990. Well, that board ended up, Brian did it on a number of times, and I escorted for him um, with a bunch of friends. And I just remember being, I remember going to sleep, waking up, going to sleep, waking up, eating, taking a nap, drinking a beer, like, and he's still paddling. I just couldn't believe it. Like I had <laughs> never considered, like I don't remember ever thinking about that channel until going out there just by chance, getting on this boat and escorting with a bunch of other guys. And it was a friggin' full day. I just couldn't believe it. And then the next year, one of my other buddies did it on that board. And the next year I got that, I bought that board like the year after, I think a couple of other guys did it on that. Or yeah, Brian long, did it a few times. How long a board? That was a 17 foot, I love Joe, but this is like an early or like a mid eighties board. With a tiller? No, no tiller. way pre-tiller. <clears throat> but this, now this story is about you, so I'm, I'm gonna stop. But when I was in college and I was gonna get ready for a surf trip and there was no waves, I would go paddle on a old windsurfer in Perfect. the bay here well, in Newport and also in San Diego. So we were doing a lot of the same things. Yeah. And then I saw a prone paddleboard and I'm like, oh, I gotta go do that. And that's where I kind of got back into it, ironically, around the time. And I was training in 95, and I ended up having to have back surgery, and I couldn't race. And my buddy Brad Jacobson, Newport Beach lifeguard, grew up with him here, saw him the other day. He ended up doing it that year in 95, your first year, yeah, which was perfect. Nice year. yeah, Like one of the best ever, if I recall. Yeah. And they did a, do you remember the article they did that year? Yes, I did, in what Surfer's was, Journal. What I remember about that article was a full page center spread about the classic and it was mirror glass, right? Perfect conditions. Yeah. And everybody got so fired up to do it, including me. We're all like, <laughs> we got to do this. We got to do this. And the next yeah. year it went from like 40 people, which was the average. So it was mostly just lifeguards yeah. from the South Bay more than anything else, maybe some from San Diego. And the next year, everybody wanted a piece of it and we all had to qualify. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about 96, my first year, Scott Lincoln's first year, you know, Scott, well, yes. what was 90? So you had 95 perfect. What mm -hmm. was 96 like for you? Paddleboard race from hell took me two hours longer to finish the damn thing. So uh, it was rough. It was, we had half the field didn't finish, which yeah. I think is the first time this last year, 2023 was like what they say is like the second worst ever. They've right had, behind They've it. had quite a few bad years, quite lately. a few. But, but yeah. not, I don't think, as bad as 96. And the equipment was much more primitive back then. Compared, like the boards we were on in 96 were much different than what we're on today. Uh, Jack Linky? Yeah, and yeah. I was on a bark. No, nobody had rudders. There was one rudder in the race. So, right. so let's, let's talk about why prone paddling. Like, so you did it those first couple of years. Was it all because of the fundraising focus or? Absolutely. Got 90, it. 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. 2000. So you got five years in. Were they all, what was the name of? Six. Six years. And got then it. I came back in, in 2011 and did one more. Awesome. Seven of them. So let's talk about that fundraiser. How did that go? How much money? What kind of impact do you think you had or do you know that you had? Almost a million dollars. Oh my in, God, that's incredible. In uh, five years, six years, five. I can't even count. That's why we need you here, Mark. You're good <laughs> with numbers. Um, Almost a million dollars. That's incredible. All for cancer research at Hogue. At Hogue. Yeah. That's that is incredible. Congratulations. Yeah. I mean that's I'm proud of it. Rightly so. I mean that's amazing. I married Hogue Hospital for six years. Yeah. You know. That's cool. I mean, we always say so you said it and I'll get back to what I, we always say. Paddle for the cure. Is it paddle for a cure or paddle for the cure? The cure. I want to make sure I have it right. I remember when you were doing that. And it was so cool because you were a one man band. It was you and the ocean and the Catalina classic. Right. And in Newport, it was pretty neat to see what you were doing. I didn't, I knew of you. I didn't know you well at the time. Um, in 20, in 1999, um, Keith Minamitsu yes. started ocean of hope with our friend Susie lighter to raise money for cancer, for sarcoma cancer. Mm -hmm. And Keith did the exact same thing you did. He's like, I got to figure out how to raise money to support this organization because Susie, his best friend, both your, went to your alma mater 
And he took a year off and trained for the Catalina Classic. He was not a paddler. He wasn't even a big surfer. And he ended up doing the Classic 10 years. But for the first half a dozen of those years, it was full-blown focus on mm -hmm. fundraising for right. cancer. Yeah. And it was called Ocean of Hope. Right. And when I saw him doing it, I already had done the Classic once. I, that got me super fired up to get back involved. And then I ended up being a part of Ocean Hope for the next 10 years and then ran it for most of those years and then passed it on to Amy Spector who ran for another 10 years. And it was really the, it was following the Mike Rogers model, the paddle for the cure model of, you're already like to your point, how can I, we always talk about it with endurance athletes, especially in this chair, you're already training your butt off. It's a somewhat selfish endeavor. So if you can, do something really good with that time. You're already yes. training. You're already spending the time out there. If you can do something really good for others, man, does it make it a much more impactful thing, right? I think the most important thing in life is can I help other people? And that's it. I mean, I'm going to go paddle. I'm going to beat myself up. I'm going to raise money and raise awareness and make a difference. Well, you definitely did. Um, when you're in those dark places, which are inevitably going to be, what's your average race time? Seven-ish, six and a half, seven? Uh, my better times are like 6.23, 6.40. Then the race from hell was eight hours and 23 yeah, minutes. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't too far ahead of you on that one. Um, when you're in circumstances like that where it's hard mm -hmm. and you're doing it for something bigger than yourself, how does that power you? When you feel like there's red hot pokers in your rhomboids and you can't even pick your head up and then you sit there and you go there's people in hospital beds that i promised to finish this race i'm going to finish the damn thing and you would you know go out of body for a while um i'm sure you've done that a million times haven't you yeah there's been a there's a lot of people paddling with you and they'd all rather be able to paddle than what they're doing right yeah, right like this short term one couple hours of pain is nothing compared to what they're going through right that'll exactly that'll spur you along right i remember being in so much pain getting closer to palos verdes and this fly was coming by and hold I on look, what, what I, was coming by a fly a fly a bug like a, a little fly, bug fly. Okay. It was a and he left me <laughs> <laughs> he left me in the back and i, I was like come you on you got dropped by a, a fly, fly. Yeah, that's a quote. We might have to call that. I was dropped by a fly. Um, T-shirt. Pretty powerful, right? Yeah, it's so good. I love that story. Um, you had one year where you, like, you were injured and you still finished. What happened? Uh, two years. My first year, a mile off the island, my stepfather in a thirty-seven foot boat. I'm paddling. I'm nervous. This is one mile in on your first year. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Just and I sure. said something told me to look up here's the bow of the boat and i kicked my board out this way so that it didn't have a hole in it and i went underwater and barely missed the prop my wrist swelled up because i had to hit the boat and i came up and i just started yelling obscenities and i was gone i was probably doing eight knots i was just like just stay away from me and i was like did that really happen and uh but then the other time I got hurt, I tore intercostal muscle trying to catch Scott Lincoln. Mm. I flopped down from the knee position and ripped it open. And I asked him to give me, you know, 10 Nuprin. And I chewed him up and kept paddling because I'm not going to stop. Yeah, that's awesome. What was training like for you here? Because it was interesting, as I always used to say, you're, there used to be like four of us yeah. paddling prone here. There was you, but you always kind of tr trained on your own. Scott Lincoln and I would train, and maybe there'd be another person, a Jeff Erickson, a Jim Netzer, or somebody else, Keith Minamitsu. But you were always training, but you never trained with anybody, did you? I trained the first year with Frank Jester. Frank Jester. Who won the stock class in 95. And he was a lifeguard, Coast Guard, FBI. Great guy. And he was also a breaststroke champion, so he knew how to swim. Mm. I didn't know how to swim. I'm a football player. And he just went, no, 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 this is totally wrong. I met him in the fog in the bay, and I was like, it was like seeing a, a white elephant. I'm like, holy shit, that's a paddleboard. He's, yeah, you want to paddle together? Yeah, sure. We became great friends and trained together. That's cool. You know, I still have, that's when you say that, because I still, 
for so many years, there were so few of us around here. Cause there was, like I said, there was three or four of us every year yeah. spattered like across the whole bay, the whole ocean. Like we're, unless you go with somebody, you don't typically see them, but anybody I would see on a prone board and still to this day, I will paddle up. If I see a prone paddler, I paddle up because I've made, I've made a lot of friends prone paddling because yeah. there's, there were so few of us. Now what's cool is today with the Ben Carlson paddle, with the open water paddle there and with vessel paddle boards and Joe Barks boards, there's this huge Orange County Newport resurgence or surgeons, not even new. There's tons of prone paddlers out here now. And it's like, it's a whole community, which is wonderful, but it's so different. Mike Roberts with Vessel. Yeah. Yep. He's selling boards Between everywhere. Mikey Roberts and Spencer Purdy. Yeah. Spencer Purdy, who started the Ben Did Go, the Ben Carlson fundraiser, who was in this chair. And Mike Roberts, who built Vessel, really allowed for all these people that really never had access before to mm -hmm. get in. Joe Barks boards have always been the best and premier, but they're man or handmade for, for the most part. Right. So this really opened up and from a price point is those two people together, those two guys have built this community of paddling in Orange County and Newport, which has been great because again, the white elephants were like, you just never saw people on prone. If you did, mm -hmm. you were like, who are you? Let's go paddle together. You see a paddler out in the ocean and people will go, hey, Mike, there's a paddler out there. And now I'm like, okay, that's great. Yeah, it's a little different. But I still, whenever, whenever I see you, I always come over. You sneak up on me. Every once in a while. Yeah, but you do. So you're still paddling a lot prone and you're paddling with guys a fair bit younger than you. In their 40s, yeah. yeah. Chris Starkweather, he's, yep. he's getting faster all the time. His dad was my marine science teacher at, New, at Crown Lamar High School. And he was a swim coach, wasn't he? Was he was a swim coach. Yeah. Um, he was a lifeguard. Yeah, Stark was a rad teacher. I haven't seen him in a while, but I know he's still around. Well, Chris is a super mellow guy, and he, he's learning quick. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's fun. Um, what's the allure of prone paddling? Like, what, what is it about it that still, 30 years later, you're still doing it? Uh, going out in the ocean and getting in a pod of dolphins and disappearing sometimes i'll paddle four miles in a pot of dolphins i don't even know how i got from point a to point b because you're part of the the pod it's just unbelievable yeah people don't i mean it, it is a dream for still for us every single time we get that opportunity but always dolphins in big pods oftentimes when you're on a prone board because you're relatively slow like average speed is somewhere around five miles an hour yeah so and there's <clears> a bunch of them and they are not Unless they're real skittish, oftentimes they'll come up and they're crisscrossing under your board, hanging right with you. They're not afraid. Like, we're not a threat. Uh -uh. No. And it's magic. It is. Now, let me ask you a question. We know what you feel about stingrays. Dolphins and sea lions, we see tons of. They come close. It's fun. It's beautiful. What's been off the coast a lot lately? Orcas. Have you ever seen one up close? Uh, I haven't yet. No. What, ha what would happen? Nothing. They're no, just no, no, big no. dolphins. What do but you mean? If, but if, if a pot of them came up yeah. and you're paddling on a 12 or 14 foot paddleboard, your hands in the water, you're inches off the water, would you like to see them up close and personal like that? Or Absolutely. Would, you would. Yeah. I think I, every time I'm out there, I think I would. I'm not sure I would. You would. Come it's on. It's magic. Yeah. But, and they're brilliant. They're smart. Their brains are bigger than, uh, like, and, They've been hanging around so much, which has never happened before. And there's food out there. There's a lot of food out there, but yeah. they're hanging and they're playing and they're going up and down the coast and they're seeing them all the time. It's unbelievable. But every time I'm out there, which is my happy place, I mean, yeah. long ocean paddles, especially on days like this where it's clear and you've got dolphins and sea lions, if you see a whale, all awesome. I'm not sure how I would feel <laughs> if a, you know, I think 10, you eight ton, 22 foot mature killer whale came up you and gotta checked me embrace out. it i would but man it makes me nervous even though it sounds amazing now listen as a paddler and a surfer anybody that doesn't paddle and surf and even a lot of people that do right. their first thing when they say when you say hey i'm going to go paddle the channel is it the distance or is it something else that they usually ask you about they usually say where's catalina yeah and then I, they go aren't there sharks out there yeah, always sharks. Yeah. Have you ever seen anything that can hurt you on all of the millions of miles you've paddled no. or surfed? No. No. <clears throat> no. So, doesn't mean they haven't seen us. They're down there. They don't, they don't want us. No. 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 But that's the first question I usually get. It's and like, take your rings off. Why? 
because I don't need a lure on my hand. Yeah. I did that a long time ago. Yeah, don't entice them. No. Yeah. Um, why, you, you said it, when you came to the, when you came up with your goal of the paddle for the cure. Correct. You said, I've seen that island forever and I wanted to basically see if I could do it. It seems incredibly, or yeah. incredible to, to conceive of it. Correct. And the other thing I see every day is Oak Hospital and the flag. Mm. I'm always looking at the flag to know which yeah. way the wind's blowing. Sure, that's yeah. our indicator. Yeah. Um, what did it feel like after you crossed that channel for the first time, paddled it? I was floating on the beach. All the pain is gone in about 10 minutes, and I'm the cameras, they're interviewing me. What do you think? And I'm just like smiling, like, I don't know. I just feel on top of the world. And uh, I think that year we only raised like 20 grand, so but it kept ramping up. Yeah. Um, there's something, maybe not for everybody, but when we talk to young paddlers or lifeguards or young surfers, and if you grew up here, just like you said, you grew up looking at this island that's 30 miles away and it's beautiful and on a, like we have some beautiful weather the last couple of days. Yeah. It's stunning to look at that or if you watch the sunset, but it's far. From Newport Pier, it's 30 miles. Um, or 32 miles, right in there. It's far. And we've all paddled it, or a lot of us have paddled it. But the first time, the first time's pretty magic. That accomplishment is hard to me beat. And I always say, like, when we're talking to the young guns that are looking at it for the first time, for maybe the Ben Carlson crossing, um, the big fundraiser that we did, the Ben did go, you know, I always say, listen, you've looked at this as a lifeguard or as a uh, surfer, and when you cross it the first time, Mm -hmm. And during that, because it's not a race, we always stop at mid channel, maybe say a couple words, maybe swim down a bit and kind of sell almost like when you cross the equator. Right. It is a powerful accomplishment for, for anybody. But the first time, man, that is a big, a big, I think it's a kind of a defining moment for a lot of people, certainly as a water person mm -hmm. to go, I just paddled across that channel. You'll never look at it the same. You fly over it like, poof, I've. I paddle that, and as I always say, as a joke, like, guys, it's not all guys. There's definitely women that do this, elite too. But the guys, like, if you're sitting on a beach and you've got your girl, and you're like, I've paddled that, like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> leverage that. Yeah, it's fun. Um, when you're paddling just during the week, mm -hmm. we talked a little about flow state as an artist, like when you're throwing. How much of what you're getting out there? You said we're with dolphins or chasing Garibaldi, like. How much is fitness and how much is headspace? Where does it where, do you, where does it fit in? Well, here's something you don't know because I can see by your biceps that it hasn't hit you yet. But in another 20 years, stay on it because when I used to paddle and train, you know, I was cut, I was vacillated, everything was where it should be. Now I'll paddle, you know, 10 miles, and I go. What the hell happened to you? Mm. You know, muscles are hanging. It's hard. I mean, a Versa Climber was nice enough to give me a machine, and that kind of works in good with paddling. Um, but it's hard to get that pump anymore. I mean, see that? It's, I don't know. Hold on. Just for how old are you? Almost 74. How many miles did you paddle today? Eight and a quarter. Prone. Yeah. Of all the paddling sports, What's the hardest? Prone paddling on a paddleboard, because we used to call them the pain sticks. The pain stick, yeah. yeah. So listen, at any age, an eight and a half mile prone paddle is challenging. 73, dude, kudos. And if you've got some pain, listen, anybody's gonna have pain after doing eight and a half miles. So just don't stop, right? That was your point, don't ever stop. I always said that, yeah. Don't, don't ever stop. stop. And you haven't, and I love that it goes all the way back to you said, oh, I would swim across the bay and I'd go do stadiums and I'd go do this and this and this while everybody else was, doing whatever like you, you haven't stopped not yet what wins surfing or prone paddling hard to say in perfect conditions prone paddling maybe mm. what's a perfect prone paddling session look like if there's such a Just thing a slight bump one two mile an hour on the water what route where where are you like go out at blackies and go down a laguna or 
I used to do a lot of runs Newport to Doheny. That's a good paddle. That's a great paddle. Yeah. Yeah. On those clear water days. Mm -hmm. I always say my happy place is my long Saturday morning paddles offshore with a couple friends. You know, I've always said this from a traveling perspective because I used to do a lot of scuba diving. And I would say, like, if you can go somewhere and you can see all the things to see on land and all the things to see on the water or from the water, you see twice as much as most people. Most people see land. Right. I would say, like, my favorite place is to be off El Moro or somewhere, you know, North Laguna just after sunrise on a beautiful Saturday morning early. It's, you know, one of the most beautiful places on the planet. We're so blessed. I mean, from a paddling perspective, we've got the bay, we've got the ocean. We've, like, we are blessed to call this home from a paddling and surfing perspective. Let me, let me ask you, how close have you come to a whale? Pretty close. Um, I've had a whale, a, a juvenile gray whale come up right offshore, um, right between two of us. And like within 10 feet, right off Laguna. Right. Stunning. Never now I've also seen, it. never forget, ever. No. We see dolphins all the time. I had a dolphin come under and I was able to touch it. That blew my mind. Yeah. Because they're brilliant. They're so smart and they know what they're doing. They know exactly where everything is. But this guy was just hanging with me and he came up right to my hand. Not like I went, like he came up and like my dog would do and allowed me to pet him. Like it was, I'll never forget it. Yeah. I've also seen great white sharks. One day, four times on stand up out at um, Old Man's or down at Dog Beach in San Onofre. And they're juvenile down there and they're very well known that they're there. But knowing they're there and seeing them there, <laughs> I mean, it's super recognizable. The shape of their fin, the shape of their tail. Um, the first time was really cool. The fourth time, it was all the same day. By the fourth time, I was like, all right, I think I'm pushing my luck. I'm out of here. But I mean, there was hundreds of people out surfing. I just, the angle I had from stand up, I got to see them. But that's pretty neat. Never seen the orcas. Never seen anything that can hurt me out in the water. Blue whales. Never seen. Oh, no, no, no. I did. I saw blue whales when they were staying up in the South Bay 10 years ago or so. They were hanging out right but like on the north side of Palos Verdes. And they were there for days. And we, we had a yes. big group of us. <clears throat> and they were... I mean, I felt, I always say it felt like I was at a train station because there were school bus, school buses or trains. They're so big coming up and going down all around us. They, it was spectacular. And I don't know if I'll ever. Almost. What do you wear year round? Jacket. So. And trunks. Yeah. So the water right now is probably 58, 59. It, it was a degree or two warmer, maybe 60. Okay. But it'll get down to 50. The coldest of days, it'll get down to the, the mid 50s here. If the wind's blowing, yes. Yeah, that's a whole different animal. And you're yeah. year round. You're yeah. not wearing a full suit. I have one. But do you ever wear it? No. Okay. So. How is that? Because I'll just equate it. I get frigging cold. And a lot of people, most people wear full suits on all this gear. Even paddling in the morning, there's different levels of what people wear. Willie Reichenstein, I hope to get him in here. He's a, it, it, I always say if it's eight degrees or 80 degrees, he's wearing a pair of trunks and a cotton t-shirt. Meanwhile, the rest of us are bundled up in beanies and all this. I get frigging cold and he's in shorts and a t-shirt. What are you morning. wearing? I'm wearing long sleeve, a boat. short sleeve. I'm wearing long pants, oftentimes booties. If it's below a certain threshold, I might even have gloves on, which I don't like. And he's in the same thing, but you're the same. You are wearing shorts and a two millimeter wetsuit top. It's if I'm surfing, if, if you're I'm surfing. paddling, I'm wearing Lycra. Yeah, nominal, but surfing even more so because you're sitting still the whole time yeah. or you're sitting when you're not surfing. You've always been that way. How is it this, you know, these days, Cold plunges, all this stuff is so hot. Everybody's talking about cold plunge and ice baths and all this stuff. You have a tolerance for it. You've either trained yourself or what is it? Because I haven't figured it out, but you have. Is it natural? Is it trained? Is it will? What, what is it? It's attitude. Mm. What's the attitude? 
Yeah. Teach me. The hell with it. I got it. I'm fine. And I feel more comfortable wearing a jacket than I do a full suit. Well, I love the thought of it, except I wouldn't be able to feel my fingers or toes or anything else. No, I'm okay. My brother's putting in a cold plunge. You'll have to come over and try that too. Well, yeah, but that's for three minutes. That's You're true. out there surfing every day for 50 years. Is it just, is it really, or do you just not get cold or do you just don't let yourself get cold? I get cold, but I don't admit it. Years ago in the hotel, we had a bunch of Australians. Every night they got drunk. And every day in the morning, they'd roll out of these, the rooms and I'd go, how do you guys do it? They go, we lie. They go, we're crushed, but we just lie. Okay, there's no lying in the ocean in a wetsuit. Like, they can lie. Oh, I'm not hungover. Yeah. You can't, you're not faking it. So listen, I just find it, it's gnarly. Like there's only a few people that do that. Most people are in full wetsuits using the bed. Like the gear these days, it's super comfortable. Absolutely, I'm gonna try it someday. No, no you're not. Yes, I, am. I, I super appreciate that you don't have to do that. Listen, your story, we talked a little bit about it, about the paddle for, for a cure, the paddle cure. for the cure. Yes. Led into Ocean of Hope. Right. Which is now led into the Ben Carlson Foundation and the Ben Did Go, which has led into Open Water, Project Open Water and their crossing and lots of other ones that are people <coughs> using that channel, following kind of the same strategy. How does that make you feel? If, if I was part of it, I feel very good. For sure you were part of it. For sure you were part of it. Um, Mike, do you have a favorite surf spot? I know I'm jumping to a different story, but it's a curious one for me. Probably uh, Infinities on Kauai. I don't know where that is. And Pacala's. I... Oh, Pacala's. Long left. Yeah, yeah. got it. Did you, have you spent a lot of time surfing other places? No. Hawaii, Mexico. No, I didn't get around. What about, oh, sorry. I was no. working in a hotel for 32 yeah. years. I had no time. Yeah. No. Got it. Paddling? Have you done races outside of California? I've, I've done races on Kauai on a surfboard. On a surfboard? Yeah. Well, there was a few paddle boards in the race too, but I only had a surfboard, so I raced the surfboard. Why were you spending time on Kauai? I just liked it. Yeah. Garden Island, yeah. you know. It's a good spot. You like it. I do quite yeah. a bit, quite, quite a bit. Um, if we had a magic wand, where would you go surf today? Today? Yeah. Any time? Any, you could, anywhere that there, there's good waves wherever you go. Where would you go? Would you go to Pacala's? I would, yeah. Gotcha. That'll work for me. Yeah, rightly so, rightly so. Um, What's next for you, bud? Next for me is trying to not stop. Because honestly, I have crepitus, torn deltoid, blown bicep, and they all slow me down, but I have to just forget it. But you keep on surfing, keep on paddling. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the photography. Because so if, if anybody wants to see because your photography, I was telling my mom, I'm like, oh, I'm oh. interviewing Mike. She's like, oh, he posts all that amazing sunrise footage. Like, tell us about that. I go to Dory Daily in the morning at six o'clock, get my first cup of coffee, and then I go out and wait to see if the colors are coming. Some mornings they tempt you and there's a little bit of red, and then all of a sudden it goes gray and it's done. And other mornings it's just a show. It's unbelievable. So it's something I do. They're really cool. And yeah. Thanks. What are you shooting with? My phone. That's your phone? Yeah. Okay. That just shows you what nature can do because it's stunning. What's your Instagram handle if anybody wants to see that? Mike Rogers 63. Got it. Which was my football number. Oh, that's cool. That's super cool. What's your passion for your, your dogs? You, historically, you've always had Aussies. a dog or two in your car. Yeah. Aussies are just great. They're, they have such an amazing, they're like on land dolphins. I know. Yeah, that's fun. Well, listen, I could go on and on and keep asking questions. I just, I really appreciate you sharing the history, um, the paddling, the surf, the fundraising. I didn't know, I truly didn't know anything about your, your upbringing around here. So I, I really appreciate connecting those dots for us. I think because the folks that are going to watch this are going to go, gosh, I've seen him for 30 years and I didn't know any of that. It's oh. really neat. So 
thanks for being a part of it. I really appreciate it. It's awesome to see you, and we'll see you in the water. Thanks for having me. You got it, buddy. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you.